we're still in Ephesians. Ephesians, we're in chapter 2, verse 11 through 32. Ephesians uh, 2, 11 through 32. And our key word this morning is unity. Unity. You know, if uh, you were to travel to Jerusalem in the days of the Apostle Paul, you would have found a low wall on the temple grounds three or four feet high. It had several entrances, and at each entrance was a warning sign in three different languages. There are also guards there posted, and it warned the Gentiles not to trespass that wall on pain of death. Now, they can only worship God on that property from way back. They can only worship God afar off. They were not welcome to worship God with the Jews. That was exclusive to the Jews. They were exclusive in all aspects. A Gentile could not go and sacrifice. A Gentile could not go and uh, do any part of any of the worship service at all. They had to do it from afar. Now, Paul had a ministry to the Gentiles. He was called by God to be the apostle to the Gentiles. And there were several Gentiles who labored with him in the ministry. And Paul had not always been like this. He had started out being a racist. He had started out being an enemy of Gentiles. And he started off hating the Gentiles as a regular Jew in those days would hate the Gentiles. And that all changed on the the road to Damascus, as you know. It all changed, and he came to Christ, and all of a sudden he was deputized and commissioned to go to the people that he once hated and to take the gospel to them. So we'll be starting with the way we were. You remember how you were before you were saved? (laughs) Well, I try and forget. But the way we were, therefore remember that formerly you, the Gentiles in the flesh, who were called uncircumcised, uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision, which was performed in the flesh by human hands. Remember that you are at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope without God in the world. Ephesians 2, 11 and 12. Paul is writing to believers in the city of Ephesus. They are mostly Gentiles. They are known in the beginning as uh, uncircumcision. They do not share in their bodies a sign of the Abrahamic covenant. And there was a time that their situation was even worse. They were separated from Christ. They are shut off from the commonwealth of Israel. They were strangers to the covenant of the promise. The Jews had the promise of a Messiah. They're a commonwealth of Israel, God's holy nation, and they were bound to God through his covenant promises. The Gentiles had none of this. As we hear from Paul talking about how we used to be, we are reminded of a similar passage earlier in this chapter. The general outline is the same. First, Paul speaks to their former condition of sin, And then he describes what God has done in bringing salvation. In Ephesians 2, 1 through 10, we went over this last week. They saw that you were dead in your trespasses and sin. Verse 2, chapter 2, verse 1. In Ephesians 2, 11 through 22, we see that you were at the time separate from Christ. Verse 2, chapter 2, verse 12. In Ephesians 1 through 10, we saw that you formerly lived in the lusts of your flesh. And last week we described that in detail, chapter 2, verse 3. In Ephesians 2, 11 and 12, we see that you were excluded 
from the commonwealth of Israel. Chapter 2, verse 12. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 through 10, we saw the unbelievers indulging in the desires of the flesh and of the mind. In chapter 2, verse 3, and in Ephesians 2, 12 through 22, we see those who are strangers to the covenants of the promise. In Ephesians 2, 1 through 10, we saw those who were by nature children of wrath. In Ephesians 2, 11 through 22, we see those having no hope without God in the world. Hmm. In Ephesians 1, uh, 2, 1 through 10, we saw that God has made us alive together in Christ. Chapter 2, verse 4 through 5, in Ephesians 2, 11 and 12, we see that you have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Chapter 2, verse 13. Paul says that they were without God. And the Greek word there, atheos, is, we get the word atheist. It means atheist. They were considered atheists because they knew nothing about the true God. Now, for our folks in our audience, our extended congregation around the world, I'd like to ask this question. How about you? Are you an atheist? Hmm. Well, you might say, well, of course not. I'm not an atheist at all. I believe in scripture. I believe in a, a, uh, a God, of, uh, a supreme being, someone who is bigger than I. Uh, but, but are you living your life as though you really have no God at all? If you are not loving him with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind, then, then if you're not serving him, then you are, without even knowing it probably, a practicing atheist. So that, that's the past. I remember when I was an atheist. I didn't admit it. I, I just practiced it. <laughs> didn't go to church. Didn't want to have anything to do with Christians. And, uh, you know, the moment that I found Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior, that all changed. It, it was all different. I didn't change it. He changed it from the inside out. So what has God done? He has given us peace. Isn't that a great word? I love that word, and, and people just clamor for peace all around the world today. In every culture, in every language, in every country, they have this on their mind, especially nowadays, where there's so much violence in the world. They have peace on their mind. So now we'll read Ephesians 2, 13 through 18. But now in Christ Jesus, you who are formerly afar off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity. The word there is hatred. The enmity, which is the law of the commandments containing ordinances, so that in himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace. Verse 16, and might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross by it having put to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him we have both have our access in one spirit to the Father. Just when things are seen as bad as they can be, we get introduced to a combining of contrast. Here we are. We, are. we have war in our hearts. We have war going on all around us. We're far from God. And yet Jesus Christ came to bring peace to our souls, to bring peace to our nations and our people. And that was to start with the Jews. And then it was supposed to go out around the world at that time, and it never happened that way. We were formerly far off, and we've been brought near. Notice a change in the time and the kind of action. The movement is from a continuous to a certain period of time. 
In verse 11 and 12, we see a continuing action in the past. It's known in the Greek language as an imperfect tense. But this changes in verse 13 to a point in time. A point in time. So we're talking about the past. We can't change the past. That's written down. But now we come to a point in time where something happens. We're continually separated from Christ and shut off from uh, Israel and strangers to the covenant. But then something happened in a point of time. That something is Jesus. He did a work that brought us near to God. You and your life have a point in time. If you're saved, you can point back to a time. You may not know the exact date. You may not know the exact hour. There are some people that I talk to and they can tell me exactly the day and the hour that they got saved. And that's wonderful. I wish I would have remembered it. All I know is the month and the year. But I have to tell you, there was an exact time where you came face to face with your sins, where you came face to face with judgment, and where you came face to face with Jesus Christ. And you made that choice that changed your life forever. You, by faith, gave your life to Jesus Christ. You admitted your sins. You you ask the Lord to forgive you of your sin. And the whole spectrum of your life changed from the inside out. You remember that time? I do. And I love to reminisce about it. It also makes me responsible for how I'm walking with Christ. If I belong to him, I gave myself over to him. I need to walk with him. And so I go back to that point in time that all of us had to check up. Well, it means your drawing near was not because of your self-effort. <laughs> I remember that morning I got up to go to work, and uh, it was just another summer day, just like usual. And there's no usual days for a Christian, right? I had an appointment, a divine appointment, with Almighty God. I didn't know that. I had no inkling of it whatsoever. So I went to work just like I usually would and goofed off like I usually did. And uh, boy, at noon, time changed. Everything from that moment on has changed me. It's radical. I was talking to some fellows yesterday. And uh, they go to a legal, when they go to church, they go to a legalistic church a legalistic denomination requires you to know all when to get up and when to say something and when to sit down and say nothing all of this is ritualistic it doesn't save anybody and um, so i told him you know really i had nothing to do with my salvation except to accept that just just reach out and, and say yes lord i accept you that's all i did I didn't go through any rituals. I didn't talk to any pastor or priest at all. I just talked to the Lord. And it changed me. You can go through all of that other stuff you want to try, and you're going to find out it's empty. It's powerless. The power of God is in Jesus Christ. The power of God is put into effect by the Holy Spirit who calls us to Christ. And then we make the choice and the Holy Spirit fills us with his presence. What a wonderful time that is. Rather simple. Didn't have to do a whole lot. But boy, did it ever change. And, you know, we talk of the blood of Jesus Christ and, and the price that he paid. And that's talking covenant language. When you make a covenant in the ancient world, you would... You would uh, kill a sacrifice, put it down the middle, and part it. And then both people who are making that covenant with one another would take their hand and walk through that together. In other words, it's unbreakable. It's an unbreakable covenant. That's serious business. When we get saved, we accept the new covenant. That's serious business. When we get saved and we get changed... We come out the other side of that covenant, that blood covenant, and we're a new person in Jesus Christ. 
and we cannot break that covenant. It's impossible for us to go back. Well, in him you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Colossians 2.11. We had nothing to do with it. He did it all. And now we're circumcised, uh, not in our flesh, but in our soul. We're circumcised according to the new covenant, and Jesus paid the price and made that new covenant in his blood. Verses 14 through 18 are presented in a form uh, that we can understand. And notice the alternate use of the words peace and enmity. Uh, and one, he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier in 214. Number two, abolishing in his flesh the hatred or the enmity. I'll read that, verse 14. For he himself is our peace, who has made both one and broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity that is the law of the commandments contained in ordinances. They're all abolished. They're all gone, all of them. So as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace. Verse 16, And he that might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity, he came and preached peace to you who are far off and peace to those who were near. The Jews who supposedly were near because of their religion can get saved. The Gentiles who were, who were pushed aside, who were ostracized, who were hated, can now get saved. And guess what happens? We become brothers with one another. <laughs> we, the, the, the Jews that get saved love the Christians. The Christians that get saved love the Jews. We can worship together with a saved Jew. We can sing together with a saved Jew. We can study the word together with a saved Jew. In fact, I like doing that because they have such a history of the Old Testament scriptures. I, I like hearing them when they have the basis for the New Testament. I like telling uh, sometimes an unsaved Jew, thank you so much for Jesus Christ. And they look at me like, a, what? Yes, Jesus Christ was a Jew. And without him, there's no salvation. So thank you so much for your Jewish heritage that gave me my Savior. That really locks them up down good and tight. The way Jesus brought about peace involved the destruction of those things which stood in the way of peace. Legalism stands in the way of people being saved. Uh, and I have plenty of stories because at one time this was a fairly legalistic church. Women had to had to wear dresses. No, no, no pantsuits. No, until someone came and wore a pantsuit, <laughs> and there was a, a furious fight over that. Uh, young people in the summertime, they couldn't come in in shorts, and you know. Well, there's one of our uh, leaders at the time that said they're coming in, and another one that said over my dead body, and guess who won that? They brought a whole busload of kids in here on a Sunday night service, and they sat in the back, and I'll never forget it, they, they had decent clothes on, and some of them got saved. That's the bottom line. Now, we do things decently in order. We have an order of service. We, we, we honor the Lord with our behavior here and all of that. But we have the freedom in Jesus Christ to express ourselves. We have the freedom in Jesus Christ to worship him. All of us are a little different in our worship, I think. Jesus Christ gives us freedom and he gives us peace. There never ever should be a time where any Christian gets uh, uh, crossed uh, with some other Christian to the place where they have enmity between them. 
There never should be a time like that. If you're a true Christian, you're going to say, well, it's just an impassable thing. I'll just take the blame. I'll just take the blame, even though I know I'm right. I'll just take the blame, shake his hand, and uh, we'll try and pass that thing up. God wants us to be at peace. It breaks my heart when I see churches that split. It's usually because someone wants to be sovereign over another one. Someone thinks they're better than someone else. And what they're doing is, is splitting a church so there's no fellowship there, there's no peace there. How can you have an unpeaceful situation in a church and expect people to get saved and expect people to, to walk with Jesus Christ? It just doesn't work that way. Galatians 6.10 says this, Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all. An opportunity to do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. You guys are special. <laughs> we ought to do everything we can for one another. And boy, around this place, there's some folks that are really good at that. And I'm so glad for that. I started a, um, oh, several years ago, I guess it is now, over at the warehouse on Saturday. Uh, there are a couple of guys, a couple of Christians, and we'd hug when we walk in. And then that began to be a thing, kind of. And um, then I began to hug some other guys. And I thought, you know, I don't know if they want me to hug them or not. I just hug them. <laughs> and uh, yesterday I was over there for a short time, and one of the fellows got out of his car and he walked up to me and he says, Where's my hug? I've been waiting all week for the hug. <laughs> hey, you know, we, we minister to people, don't we? Even when we're not aware of it. That's wonderful, isn't it? To bring peace to people's heart. To encourage people. To let them know they're important. <laughs> well, there has been no greater enmity than that which extended between the Jews and the Greeks. Only God could break down that wall. Only the power of Jesus Christ can break that down. Only the power of Jesus Christ can bring us together. Only the power of Jesus Christ drives us on together as a team. Neither were Gentiles above persecuting the Jews. We talked about the Jews and their hatred for the Gentiles. Boy, there was hatred coming back the other way. Isn't that the way it works? You may not even know somebody, but because of some circumstances... Way may they even look or something like that. You don't like them. Well, it comes back the other way. You're not going to be able to hide that forever. So the, the Gentiles hated the Jews. They were good at persecuting the Jews. There was once they attempted in the days of Xerxes to pass an ordinance to exterminate the Jews, the whole bunch. On another occasion, Jews have been forbidden to read their own scriptures or to circumcise their young on the pain of death. In Paul's day, all the Jews had been banished from the city of Rome itself. But Christ brought peace. This has great application to the church today. It means that the church has a bias for uh, radical reconciliation. That's what we're here for between a Jew and Gentile, between black and white, between Anglo and Hispanic. Do you know there's only one race? There's only one race, the human race. We are all members of one race. Now, those that want to so discontent and those that want to break us apart and have us suspicious of each other, they break it down into what they call races. And they call us racists, a word invented by the Communist Party in the 20s, by the way. We're not racists at all. We're all human beings. There's only one race as far as God is concerned. And that's the way it ought to be as far as we are concerned. Christ brought peace. And the curse of Babel was visually overturned at Pentecost. The implication of all that event is that our racial distinction should no longer divide us. Our languages shouldn't divide us. Our culture shouldn't divide us. That was all done away with. Now we go to what God is doing now in the present. He's building 
he's building. Verses uh, 19 through 22. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens. I like that. No one's better than anybody else. We're fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord in whom you also are being built together in a dwelling of God in the Spirit, capital S, the Holy Spirit. Three illustrations are given in verse uh, 19 and 20 to the picture of the unification of the Jews and Gentiles, and that is we're a city. We're citizens together. We're fellow citizens and saints. Number two, a family, in verses 19b, of God's household. We're all in his household as a family. And then a building, in verse 20. Having been built, the temple is a temple. All of us together represent a temple. It's not a building, it's people. A temple can be anything from a schoolroom to a magnificent auditorium like this. That's a physical temple. There's a spiritual temple, a spiritual church, if you will, made up of believers. All of them. No discrimination. Everybody can come. That's what he's saying here. You have to put all that other junk aside. Yes, it's ancient in its origin. Yes, the hatred has been there on both sides. But you need to be reconciled by Jesus Christ to those who are your brothers and sisters. And that's what formed the temple of God. The apostles and the, and the prophets who presented the truth of the work of Christ to men who believed and became part, and they became part of the temple, the building. The Ephesians had never met Jesus in the flesh most people never met Jesus in the flesh, but they did meet Paul and Silas. Paul and Silas laid the foundation of their truth. You say, well, Jesus Christ ought to be the foundation of the truth. Well, he plays an even more important role than that. He's the cornerstone. The cornerstone that's been rejected now is the cornerstone of this whole temple that goes all around the world. Jesus Christ is the one that's proclaimed. And the builders are soul winners that go out and build brick by brick, person by person. They build those walls up and are used of God in a great way. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. Psalm 118.22 Therefore it is also contained in the scriptures, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. 1 Peter 2, 6. Isn't that great? He that believes on Jesus. You can give your testimony and not be ashamed of anything. You can live for Jesus Christ and not be ashamed of what you're doing. You are uh, built into that wall that the cornerstone has put together. Each one of us is vitally important. So if you're in Christ, you're part of that building and have been fitted together with me and with the rest of the church. We are a building. We are not just a building. We are a temple of believers together. Uh, well, you know what a temple is? It's a place where you go to meet God. You know what unity does to a, a congregation? It makes us fierce. It gives us power. It... We can, we can do things that, that people can't hardly believe it. When there's unity, there's growth. When there's unity, there's love. Where there's unity, there's peace I'm talking about in our church. So that when we start laying out, uh, particularly in this transition time, new plans. We started it this morning. That's all new. We're going to be doing that every Sunday. Now... You give us a little slack until we get this thing down because there's quite some changes. But the church of Jesus Christ is a winner when there's unity. What can we expect? Well, we can expect some pushback from the world particularly. 
We are not very well liked in the world, but that's all right. Christians never were uh, liked in the world. Jesus Christ wasn't liked in his time. But what can we expect if we really go at this unity thing and make it work? Number one, the power of the Holy Spirit at work in our midst. The power of the Holy Spirit just take over this place. So that when people hit that door over there in our foyer and they walk in, they can feel the presence of God himself and the Holy Spirit. Number two, people coming, seeking the Lord. People coming. We invite, they'll come. 80% of the people surveyed said that if someone invites them to go to church with them, they'll go at least one time. Well, we got our work cut out for us. What do they feel when they come in here? They're going to feel the presence of Almighty God because we're together. We're a band of brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. Number three, worship service having heavenly glory as we proclaim the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ, right? <laughs> There's nothing worse than walking into a service and people just going through the motion. There's, there's no spirit there. There's no energy there. When we're unified and praying and looking forward to being with each other and serving one another as we serve Jesus Christ, I can tell you for sure, we're going to have worship services, services that will change. I saw something the other day on the Internet, so it has to be true. And it's this. <laughs> it's this, you know. Put your worship services together not to attract people, but to attract God. How about that? We, we want to attract the Spirit of God, right? We want him to take over our planning. We want him to take over every aspect of our service. We want to be attractive to people that they don't even know why they're seeking us out. They just start seeking us out. Because we're the church known in town as being loving, forgiving, having peace, and preaching the word of God. That's what we're all about. Amen? Yeah, and that uh, he takes 20 verses about to say that. I said it in a whole lot less number than that, believe me. Uh, so uh, thank you, Father, for the word of God. There may be someone listening to my voice just now that's not at peace. First of all, they're not at peace with you. <laughs> they don't have the peace of God, and they don't have peace with God. And they're wondering now, how they can receive that. If you're that person, let me just encourage you. You're doing business with the Almighty here. I just encourage you to give your life to Jesus Christ by praying this prayer. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. I'm sorry for my wicked ways. And I thank you that you died to save me. And by faith, I give my life over to you. I will serve you the rest of the time you give me here on earth. And I will uh, go out of my way to uh, be used of you. Thank you so much for all you've done for me. In Jesus' name I pray. If you prayed that prayer, you passed from spiritual death to spiritual life. That is radical. That changes you like nothing else can. And so, Father, we pray. Holy Spirit, we seal this decision in people's hearts. To the glory of Jesus' name we pray. Amen.